Hey everybody, Gregor Arturo here in Sedona, and uh, I want to talk to you about a concept that actually I started talking about when I first started doing YouTube, actually here in Arizona is where I launched my channel in Chandler, Arizona, and, which was like four or five years ago, and right after Chandler I actually got picked up in uh, hitchhiking in front of Bell Rock by my friend Walker, well, now good friends, and this is her ranch I'm at, four years, five years later, and uh, small world, and the thing that I was exploring is the concept of uh, how to get simple uh, electrical current from one medium to another, specifically metals. And so there's a, a term called contact electrification. And I actually only recently discovered this term where I was just like, it has to be somewhere in the scientific literature. I gotta find the name of this phenomenon. And maybe I took school with traditional physics, I will have learned about it. But the thing is, by not going into that into academia, I was able to develop my own theories and understanding a more simplistic uh, perception of what's actually happening, where if you even read about contact electrification, it never actually talks about the phrase pressure. And pressure is, it's, it's all pressure. And so every material has an intrinsic electric static scalar potential. And so intrinsic as it's, it's, it's intrinsically a part of that material, it's, it's intrinsic pressure and the electrostatic scalar potential is the uh, basically the electrostatic pressure that's inherent within that material. And so we are, most, we are more familiar with, say, the concept of the electric field, but the thing is, the line, if you're observing, say, an electric field line, that voltage is changing over that electric field line, that's what gives rise to an electric field. It is a difference of, of it's, a, it's a gradient of voltage but what if the voltage is all constant and you don't have an electric field? And so even the, the idea of when you have two uh, bodies, uh, both negatively charged, you have the, the lines curve away um, in either direction. But the thing is, you can literally draw a cross in the dead center between those two lines and in the middle where you're getting electrostatic scalar potential. Uh, you're, getting a, you're getting a balance point of, of where the uh, electrostatic pressure is constant within the system. And so this is, again, intrinsic to every material. And so we have a, a copper penny here. We're all very familiar with pennies. This is actually one of the, the older ones. And I got to focus on that now. A little one cent there. There you go. And so it's copper plate over zinc. And copper and zinc is in a very interesting one to work with. Not only are they just one proton difference with 29 and 30, uh, which can create interesting oscillations when you have elements that close, but they have a different work function. The work function relates to the, uh, the, the Fermi level, or the, again, the inherent electrostatic pressure within the system, uh, specifically in relation to the valence shell of an atom. And so copper has a higher work function than zinc. And so right now, these two in thermodynamic equilibrium. Now let's say I pulled off this copper coating, and so I had zinc and copper. All of a sudden, they, have, they would start to renormalize to their intrinsic scalar potential. Or if you separate them fast enough, you'd have a polarization. Uh, and uh, because uh, there's an equilibrium when they're together, and when they're separate, they, everything moves toward equilibrium. And so if you take copper and zinc and you put them together, all of a sudden it has to redistribute its pressure to become balanced within the system. And so usually when you observe this, and so like, if I, if I took, you can do this even with like, hold a penny, hold a galvanized piece of steel, because it's, it's zinc, and you take a voltmeter to them, it'll be a flow of current from one to the other in, in the millivolts. Zinc is one of the more interesting uh, metals because you can get a very high uh, millivolt ring, say 600 to 800 millivolts. And people be like, oh, this isn't much energy. There's not really much current going on. But you're getting a redistri redistribution of the, uh, of the pressure in the system to restabilize at equilibrium. And so the concept here is, with contact electrification, is how can you take advantage of this and, and actually create gains of energy? And so what is the basis to energy? It's just pressure systems. And so... The sun is the, is the fueling energy source for the earth for all its weather systems. But what is also then the next prime mover 
of weather systems on the planet besides the sun is it has to do with landmass and sea. You're having these two different, extremely different uh, materials, landscapes, and how they interact with energy and store energy, such as water, is able to store uh, heat much more readily than, say, the Earth. And uh, this fuels the weather systems. And so the thing is there's solar energy or the concept of energy, even neutrinos being emitted by the sun, there are so many forms of energy moving through us at one moment, and even the, the inherent kinetic energy within an atom. And so the idea is how do you take the intrinsic pressure that's already present around you and start to create a dynamic pressure system, an energy system that can also then start to self-organize energy, because that's what a hurricane does. A hurricane self-organizes energy, pressure. It, it builds potential energy, and then obviously converts it to work. And so where you see opposing polarities of compression, expansion, hot, cold, they're all interrelated, high humidity, low humidity, uh, uh, clockwise and counterclockwise rotation, all working within a system of a hurricane. The polarities create stability within a system. And so if you take two materials, okay, and you bring them really close together, this relates to say the cashmere effect where you have two plates say 10 nanometers apart, you're gonna start to get vibrations of the quantum vacuum oscillating back and forth in between. Well, the thing is you can take two different materials and bring them very close together like a capacitor and you're gonna get an intrinsic charge polarization between those two, and all by very small voltage. And so if you have, say, a, a better way to might say visualize this is you have two spheres, and you bring the two spheres together, all the charge on one side and all the charge on the other side are gonna start to be focalized at those points where those spheres are really close together because they have different intrinsic electric scalar potentials with those materials. However, as soon as you touch those two spheres together, the energy then redistributes around the system and restabilizes and creates equilibrium. This relates to Thomas Bearden talking about don't kill the polarity. We constantly kill the polarity with our systems. As soon as you plug something in, as soon as you hook up the battery, you start losing your voltage. You start losing your electrostatic pressure within the system. And so it's like plugging a hurricane in and being like, well, there's so much power, let's drain it. And the hurricane just dies. Well, that usually happens when it loses its energy source when it goes over land. But if you wanted to start to pull energy from a hurricane and use it for something, you would start to drain the system. Uh, but the, the concept here is if the system is self-organizing more energy than what you take out or, say, put into a load, it will keep self-organizing. It will keep growing. Or you will stabilize it as this is the max load I'm going to take outside of the system. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, someone started playing some YouTube in the background. Anyways, uh, the concept here that I'm trying to get across is how you can create a simple self-resident oscillation between differing materials. And so like, say, here, here's an example. Say you have a piece of aluminum and a piece of copper. Um, gold is even, you can create more of polarization and you actually rest these two on each other. Well, aluminum naturally oxidizes in air and forms a uh, oxide layer of aluminum oxide, corundum alumina, as it's all known as, and about four nanometers thick. Now that's, say, roughly anywhere between 100 and 200 millivolts it can handle uh, in terms of the dielectric strength. And so if you have a polarization between, I'm gonna kill any sound, Facebook, <laughs> and if you have any polarization start to build between those two, and that polarization reaches the, the level of dielectric breakdown, it's going to pulse through into, the, in, into it, and it's going to start to redistribute because you're going to have electrical connection between the two. So you, it, you have a build to 200 millivolts, it pulses. Um, and uh, well, then after that, you lose your voltage, and so then the insulator then becomes an insulator again. And if the insulator gets damaged in any way, I'm not fully familiar with how alumina handles with electrical discharge. I believe it does damage it. Uh, it reoxidizes again. And uh, you can also use uh, semiconductors. So copper can form a copper oxide on it, 
and become a semiconductor, and it has to get to a certain level of uh, a Fermi level before it becomes conductive. And so this is all I understand band gaps with conductors, insulators, and semiconductors. They're really all the same thing, it's just understanding the, the diversity of the band gaps of the material, which relates to conduction. And so, well, once you have the new materials, you know, become together, zinc and copper, they start to restabilize. We're talking about, you know, copper and aluminum. Again, it's just really two different materials. And, and then the charge starts to build up again, and it pulses again. And so aluminum, with another material, uh, you should be able to get a high frequency, very subtle, very low voltage pulse between the two. Uh, you could, this is probably more effective utilizing uh, a semiconductor than an insulator. I know John Searle was using Teflon and there would reach a dielectric breakdown, but Teflon wouldn't damage. And it might be that the insulator doesn't damage with say low enough voltage, there's not enough heat. I think it's heat that usually destroys the insulator and being it's only four nanometers and it's very low voltage, there might not even be destroyed at all. And so hopefully I will be, I will be testing some of these theories um, as I'm headed to Nevada City. And uh, it's something I've focused on for a long time, but now I have a little bit of the actual scientific literature to help support um, what I've already been thinking about for four years now. <laughs> and uh, how to create a fractal self resident oscillation. This comes into concepts of geometry and phasing, uh, using uh, natural crystals, as in their, their actual geometry of that crystal, and how you can start to create symbiosis between different forms of metal or conductors, semiconductors, insulators, piezoelectrics, and that there is a fractal organizational process taking place between these two. Contact electrification also works with uh, semiconductors and metal uh, insulator uh, junctions and so it's really it's any material and the different materials in terms of the band gaps will explain how they interact when they get really close or when they touch and uh, so this is going away from the concept of a spark gap which you need say in air you need about a kilovolt per millimeter um, and you could have a sparking effect uh, from the literature I've been reading there is a tunneling effect that can go on, especially when if the, the two are really far apart and they touch and they start to pull apart, you still get an electron flow. Um, to me, that's uh, saying there's a tunnel effect, there could really even be a spark effect because if you do have two terminals touching, like with called the dead man switch, and you break it, the spark gets pulled out. Um, you basically pull it into creation as it leaves contact. And so there's some interesting phenomena uh, going on with this. And so how do we exploit this, even though I don't like the word exploit? How do we take advantage and, and put this into utilization? And so the idea is to build up the self-resident oscillations. But at the same time, you got to take really into consideration geometry, phasing, timing, cycles, uh, the, the material, which is really just macro geometry. And uh, in terms of how do you create resonance with this system? How do you build this effect? And all you're utilizing is the intrinsic pressure within the system itself. There's already pressure in all the different materials. You're just, you're just putting together a hurricane component by component. And so this is the, the simplest concept, in my opinion, to free energy is the intrinsic pressure of a material. And when you get dissimilar materials, usually it's referred to as more dissimilar metals. And so I hope this concept was communicated in terms of understanding some basis to really uh, going forward with free energy and over unity in terms of how do you create technological hurricanes and uh, it's beautiful in terms of what can open up because you can start to get, you could say a real self-resonant crystalline generator um, and the energy is coming from the environment. And one of the things that's shown, and I've talked about many times, is when you get these systems working, there's a cooling effect. You start actually pulling the energy, it's coming from the kinetic energy of the atoms. And uh, it's, you could, there's also a concept of, say, negating friction. And you're really not negating friction, you're putting everything into resonance. And so there is no friction. Friction's only, friction is, is in, in essence, dissonance within a system. Well, Contact electrification, that is the magical term. And uh, I 
suggest you go explore it if you're curious and uh, put your mind to you, see where it goes, what you can start to develop uh, with, with this effect because that's really all I do is just looking at phenomena effects and being like, oh, this does this, this does this. Well, then how can I apply this? So that's exactly what Tesla did is he was thinking how you could apply that and that's sort of the difference between the inventor and the academic scientist it's academic science that just explores the phenomena where the inventor applies it into reality and actually brings it into our daily being. It's a, it's a work of art, as in it's art working every day. It's a part of us. It's a part of our life. And so start exploring phenomena and seeing what your lovely uh, being and creativity come forth with. Blessings, my friends. Ciao.